But right now, the economy needs a real fiscal stimulus. And without that, we're going to continue in this kind of Japanese-style malaise, growing a little bit, but barely enough to create the new jobs for the new employees. On that issue, is, the, is it because monetary policy um, by the Fed, so low interest rates, is that why you think there is now a greater role for uh, fiscal policy? Well, actually, I thought that monetary policy could never address the key problems facing our economy. It had to take the role that it did because fiscal policy wasn't there. In fact, I've been worried that because fiscal policy hasn't been there, monetary policy may actually be risking the future stability of the economy. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, the way monetary policy worked, lowering interest rate, flood of credit, worked mainly by a competitive devaluation, lowering the value of the dollar relative to other countries. Not good in terms of international relations. We saw a lot of noise from the emerging markets when we undertook QE. It was very bad for global uh, integration. But also, the other mechanism is to get the stock market up. But who benefits from the increase in the stock market? Only the very, very top. And that's why we've had a totally unbalanced recovery with the top 1% done very well, but the rest of the economy hasn't. The issue that always comes up with fiscal policy is that there are those who would say America has borrowed over a trillion dollars for the past four years. Is that a sustainable course to use more deficit spending to do some of the things that you're describing? That kind of reasoning is totally short-sighted. It was based on some research that was, turned out to be very flawed that said if government debt to GDP ratio re exceeded a certain level, then growth would be slowed. People who re looked at that research and it's been totally discredited. This is Rogoff and Reinhardt's work. Rogoff and Reinhardt's work, that's right. It told, you know, people looked at that and, and, and said it's really wrong and they tried to resuscitate it. They failed. The, for example, as the United States emerged from World War II, we had a debt GDP ratio of well over 130 percent, and yet the period after World War II was the period of our fastest economic growth, and it was a shared economic growth. The, the point is that you should never look at just one side of a balance sheet. No company would do that. The debt is your liability, but you have to look at the asset side. So if we borrowed for investments in infrastructure and in technology and education, uh, the asset side of our balance sheet would improve. The overall balance sheet would improve. You know, the United States can borrow at minus 2% real interest rate. The returns on these investments are extraordinarily high. You know, to me, it's amazing if somebody went up to business and said you could borrow at minus 2% and they said, well, I have a project yielding 25%, you w would be shocked if they didn't take it. And yet there are people saying to the United States, you shouldn't borrow at minus 2% even though you have investment projects at 25, 30, 35% returns. To me, uh, I find it uh, irresponsible, this kind of attitude. What kinds of policies would you like to see to begin to address some of all of these issues which are causing America's economic future uh, to, uh, to, uh, to face some challenges? If you look around the world, the economic forces that you described, they're global. And yet the outcomes in different countries is very different. In some countries, inequality is actually coming down. In the countries in Scandinavia, the level of inequality is much lower. The level of equality of opportunity is much higher. And yet, the overall growth is just as good, if not better. So the question is, what is it? Well, it's not the economic forces that are determining the difference between their performance and ours. 
It's our policies and our politics. And that was the third thing I emphasized. It's our policies and politics that make it impossible for us to, to deal with the real issues at hand. And that's why I put number one in our reform agenda is reforming our governance. The United States talks about governance everywhere in the world, but it doesn't look inward. The fact is that we've transformed ourselves unwittingly from a democracy with one person, one vote, to one dollar, one vote. Political inequality inevitably follows from the high level of economic inequality that we have in the United States. 